Welcome everybody. Hi, I'm your host, Baruti Carl Alexander. Yes, this is the Source Seeker Hour here on Afro Vibes Radio. Thank you for joining us. This is our third show, and we are grateful to still be, excuse me, this is our fourth show. Let me take that back. And we are grateful to be on Afro Vibes Radio, the number one internet station in the world. Yes, I'm your host, Baruti Carl Alexander, and thank you again for joining me. A source seeker. I call myself a source seeker. Many people have asked me, what does that mean? What does that mean, Baruti? A seeker seeks to connect with the divine spark within him or herself and seeks to shine that bright light from a lampstand and use this bright light to brighten a better tomorrow. That's what I am as a source seeker. Uh, in, in my day job sometimes, um, I work with special education students and it's amazing the spirit that they have. It's amazing how attuned they are to different things. Even if they can't speak, even if they can't uh, articulate or express, express what they're trying to say, you can kind of get that vibe, get that sense of everything that they're talking about or want to express to you. And I, I take that, and as a source seeker, one of my main things is to be able to express. If, if I didn't have the opportunity to, to express, it would tear me up inside. And I kind of see that in those particular special education students, that they want to get their expression out too. And they find different ways, even though they can't speak, even though they don't have the normal ways of communication, they are source seekers also, many of them, because they, they try to express in any way possible. Yes, this is the Source Seeker Hour, and I'm your host, Baruti Carl Alexander. The Source Seeker Hour discusses current events, politics, and things relevant to society in an intellectual and profound discussions. My books are Obama the Extraterrestrial and Seeking the Heart of the, and the Sword. We're going to have a great show today on the Source Seeker Hour. Thank you for joining us. Our theme today, Can Bullies Be Stopped and Should AR-15s? Should they be banned? This is a big issue in our society today. And we have two brilliant guests to discuss this. Uh, we have Mr. Rusty Adams, a former school counselor, educational specialist, focusing on school discipline and working with the most behavioral challenge students. And we have consultant Brother Durst Muhammad of AKH Educational Services. We are going to have a great show and a very profound show and a very necessary show with all of the different things that are going on in the society, the conflict, the difficulty. That is why this issue is so, so pertinent. Uh, right now, uh, before we get started, I would like to give a shout out to uh, my brothers, my friends at Green Keys Auto. You need a car? Talk to the brothers, Emmanuel and Paul. Get your cash car, get your cash car for 5000 or less. Today, all makes and models. Green Keys Auto, 8108 Gulf Freeway, 832-275-0913. That's Green Keys Auto, 8108. Very good uh, car dealership. Work with them. They'll work with you no matter what your credit is. Now we're going to get back to our show on can bullies be stopped? And, and that's a very important question because bullying leads to conflict. Conflict can lead to death. I tell anyone I hear say, and this has happened to me. Somebody says they want to fight somebody. Somebody says they want to hurt somebody. They want to hit somebody. I ask them, are you prepared to kill that person? Because you can't come in and start a fight or, 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 or you start fisticuffs or you start any kind of conflict and then say, okay, now I'm ready to stop. What if the other person does not want to stop? They don't like what you did or, or you don't like what they did. So before you go that particular far, is that something that you really want to go down the road of? And that's what brings us to our issue, bullying. There's so Even at my age, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but even at my age, I've encountered bullies. And that's amazing. Even at my age, I've encountered bullies. And bullies always think, you know, they have an advantage. They have this situation and that situation, but 
what was the psychology of a bully? What makes them uh, bully another person as an adult, as a child? Uh, Mr. Adams, what is the psychology of a bully? Oh, I would say a, a bully is something that uh, probably our society creates uh, because of the way we, we treat each other. And um, I, I definitely think, uh, you know, bullying behavior can be changed, but I think we have to look at it more from a system approach and really begin to uh, create systems that support all students so all students feel welcomed in a school. You say bullying can be stopped. Well, we do see it in our adults, so it's not just a children's thing. You, do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I, I, I would say that if you want to change the behavior of a student at a school, you have to first change the behavior of the adults that work in that school. But adults are just humans. Brother Durst, on, on that issue of bullying, I've been through bullying, uh, so many people have been through it, especially as an adult, but even as a kid, is, is it something that, are we being unrealistic, can it be stopped, or should we even try something else to make the victim stronger? Brother Dress. Bullying has been around forever since time and memorial. Mm -hmm. But in order for uh, bullying to take place, there has to be a, another party to, to be complicit with it. See, a bully is someone who tries to make the attempt. Uh, he doesn't come to become a bully until he has a victim. And so when uh, the, the, the purpose of a bully, well, a bully is someone who uses perceived power or intimidation to try to take advantage of someone else. And he does not, that definition does not get put on him until someone uh, complies or capitulates to him. And so um, it definitely can be stopped because a bully, again, only... Uh, gets that definition once he kind of uh, does a litmus test by seeing what he can do and then someone then uh, bows down to him, now he's become a bully. But if someone stands up to him, that same person does the same thing, he can't be called a bully. So I go back to what I was saying a second ago. I was saying that should we concentrate on strengthening, quote unquote, the victim of, of those who are the object of the bully? Yes, no doubt. It, how can that to, be done? To the person, I mean, historically, and we get in this, we're in this, uh, this PC, this politically correct climate. Yes. To the person, everyone can give a story that when they got tired of a bully and they stood up, they no longer were bullied. This it goes back, I mean, time, whether it can go to an individual, whether it can go to a country, we can go to a business. Once someone stood up to a bully, because the nature of a bully is only to seek that which it perceives it can take advantage of. They don't want to fight. I mean, how many times have you heard when someone uh, was quote unquote bullied and then they got tired of it and they just, they didn't even have to connect, but they took a swing back. Yes, yes. And that, that no longer took place. He looked and sought for someone else. So, uh, in my anti bullying program, on the record, I got to say, go see an adult, this, that, and the other. But off the record, I say, stand up. And you, this bullying, uh, it's not magically because historically, uh, scientifically, mathematically, you will find that the bullying ceases because of the very nature of a bully, which is that that person is weak and they're looking for weakness in someone else. And but shown as soon as strength is shown, bullying is eliminated. Yes, I would probably uh, have yeah, to, go ahead. Have uh, to uh, disagree Adam. with that. Okay, because I do think that's probably one of the myths of bullying. Uh, the best way to handle a bully is by getting even or fighting back. I'm so I would have to disagree with you on that. I, I okay, well, let's do. We let's talk. To, let's talk about. I, I think we have to. Let us to, talk about that so we can understand. We got two different aspects of, of, of bullying. Uh, can you give me your what, what you were saying about it, Brother Durst? My 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 uh, my stance on it is this: that a bully is a person who has or seeks out a, an individual, an entity that they perceive as weak, and then uses their particular. Uh, force or intimidation to get what it wants out of that particular person. Okay. My contention is that if that particular person stands up, if it shows uh, force, and, and the force can be in many different forms, doesn't have to be necessarily physical, but that, that they are not tolerated without some sort of pushback, then the bullying um, definitely subsides. Okay. From, from my vantage point. And, and I do agree. I think they do okay. stand up, but I think the way that you stand up 
can't be a, a violent way to stand up. Uh, it, it needs to be well thought out and it needs to be supported by the people that are around uh, both of those people because you, you made the comment, well, the bully's going to move on. Well, that did, really didn't change the, the bully's behavior, at least stop that incident between that bully and that victim. That's but right. that bully has now moved on to somebody else. So I would rather we, we come up with a system that deals with the bully and helps the bully a, learn a different way to learn how to deal with people, but also the victim, because I, I've worked with many victims of bullying as a school counselor, and uh, I have to teach them not to be victims, because they can draw those bullies to themselves. So uh, it, you, I, I, I'm hearing more agreement, I, I believe, than I'm hearing any difference. That, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think that, I think that as uh, my, my brother said, I think it's more so a methodology. Okay. Uh, in terms of, I think we both agree, you got to stand up to the ability, but how do you do it? That's where we may, uh, you know, come into a discussion. Bullying has such an impact on this society. I'm, if you look at the school shootings, if you look at many different situations, but especially the school shootings, there was always, not always, I can't speak for all of them, but a significant amount of them, it was bullying involved. And those students or those young people that took action felt that they were being bullied. I want to read a little bit about the Columbine shooting. This is uh, from an excerpt of Wikipedia. And for those who don't remember or don't know about the Columbine shooting, that was really the most significant first school shooting, I believe. Uh, there may have been others, but that was the first one I really heard about and took notice of. It says, the Columbine shooting of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebo, most research started as an act of revenge against bullying. Both of the shooters were classified as gifted children who had allegedly been victims of bullying for four years. According to Brooks Brown, Clebo and Harris were the most ostracized excuse me, students in the entire school. And even many of those of them regarded them, even of those who were victims at the school regarded them as the losers of the losers. So there's a correlation between conflict, bullying, and some most severe circumstances. And that's why we want to get to the heart of, of the matter. Of course, in that particular incident, incident, they uh, used weapons, and I believe 17 uh, people were killed. Or was it, tw I think it was 12 people, excuse me. I don't want to get that wrong, but I believe it was 12 people in the Columbine incident. There were 17 in the Parkland incident that just recently happened. Um, and, and you know what I would say yes. is, is why, what were the adults doing in that school? Why was that behavior allowed to happen that created these two men? I, I'm not saying that they didn't have some real deep psychological problems, but if everyone knew that that was, that was what was going on, why was it allowed to continue? And, uh, and I just want to say, I, I, I want to do a, a Martin Luther King quote real quick. It says, never, never be afraid to do what's right especially if the well-being of a person or an animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. And so I have a feeling that there were too many people that were really looking the other way when they should have been involved and engaged in that situation. I, I, I just want to say this. As a teacher and as somebody who's involved in the numbers of a school, in the situation of this young man in Parkland, there were a whole lot of signs, as we all know. Even in the situation with Columbine, there were a whole lot of signs. But society, I'm not going to just br br blame the school educators. It's the way society, because the, the police had cause to be concerned, parents, they, they had so many different uh, warnings. Something could have happened, but we have we have a gap to fill in that how far do you go to say something as opposed to being upon their rights. I mean, the, the person could just be having a bad day and exhibiting bad behavior, but now it comes back to something else. It comes back to access to guns. I do have to deal with that. I believe that is one of the issues. Now, uh, our president has put forth a proposal to say arm teachers. I'm going to surprise many people with this. I have no pro 
no problem with two people on staff besides the deputies being armed. However, there are causes of concern as far as whether teachers could handle their responsibility. But on that I say we just as messed up or great as anybody else. Because a, a policeman could, you know, have problems too. A, you know, a, a fireman can have problems too. And they can go crazy. Now, one of the questions is, would uh, a racial component come in where a, a, a kid, a, a young black kid is acting a little wild and then somebody panics on the other end? Um, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Dirk. Uh, we'll go back for a second and then go to your point about the thing, uh, about the, the guns and whatnot, and, uh, or armed instructors. In both instances, you saw in Columbine where this was going on for four years. Yes. So this, this bullying thing doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't manifest itself into instantaneous reaction. Okay. The second thing is the, the, in Parkland, again, bullying, it was a, an ongoing thing. Yes. And so when I, when I open up with my particular statement, there has to be, and we have to take approaches towards, again, what is successful in helping to stop this bullying and at the same time bring in, uh, because bullying can be a, a mental and psychological damage to the victim, and we already know that the bully has a, a problem going on. Okay. And so, um, to, again, look at uh, best practices, um, whether, again, whether it's, it, there may not be the the, the political correct or the, the, the right thing, but does it get us the results that we're looking for? In, t in four years, you mean to tell me that, and I'm quite sure the, 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 the motive, excuse me, the, uh, the way in which it was told to handle, come tell an adult, let them deal with it. And whoever was doing the bullying, they may have been brought in, stop telling Johnny, he's this, that, and the other. But has, again, it, it may seem quote unquote extreme, but his, history says, tells us that when you stand up to a bully in a manner that the bully recognizes that they no longer can do it, whether it be if it's perceived to be politically correct, if it is successful, we got to take a look at that. Uh, the second thing is, in regards to, um, again, going to, over a protracted period of time, this thing doesn't, doesn't just occur, that person has um, exhausted in their mind all avenues and that's where you see that the guns come into play. Now parlaying or segueing into the situation with the uh, arming instructors and teachers, that is, the, that is ludicrous, that is uh, again a knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. to something that even trained professional police persons that are human beings and under stressful situations who are trained and go through this particular thing, they make mistakes. Yes, they do. Now you yeah. want an instructor who is trained to educate, teach this, that, and other in a stressful situation, take a gun out, and quote-unquote defend themselves in a situation that even trained professionals get it wrong. And now you want to go at again as a knee-jerk reaction because, quote-unquote, you know, there may be some uh, that's going to uh, cause a, uh, um, uh, a deterrent. I, I certainly understand that standpoint. Completely uh, disagree. Okay, I got you. Um, on, on the one hand, I believe it's somewhat of a political ball rolling down the hill. Uh, on another, I agree, teachers should not be put in that position where they have to. But certainly, for instance, like with my special education students. But brother, let me ask you, don't, don't teachers have bad days too? What about? Yeah, I, I, that's what I mentioned Rusty, earlier. have you ever had a bad day? Yeah. I, 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 I mentioned that earlier. I agree. And now, and now I got something on my hip that can, <laughs> that can, in my in my irrational thought, can maybe help me think I can uh, not have bad. Because look, we have bullies and I. They're called students or the bad actors. Yes. Yes. You know, and, and and look, and even if you don't use it, the mere fact you have it, if you brandish it, the next time you say something, this, that, and the other, and what's going to stop? Is, is that wrong for for them to brandish it? They didn't use it. But the mere fact yes, that, that's wrong. Exactly, but they, but you put, but you put it on their hip. That's true. And then when you bring them to the office, you're gonna say, "Well, I felt fearful for my life." I certainly understand, Mr. Adams, Rusty. What you believe about uh, that particular issue? Well, let me just go back real quick, and then I'll talk about the guns in the school. Uh, you know, we were, you were talking about four years, over four years that happened at yeah. that school. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we all have heard of the the school to prison pipeline. 
and the school to prison pipeline starts in elementary school. It starts at a young age where we begin to unfortunately groom some students to end up incarcerated uh, either before they graduate or after they graduate or, or if, whenever they leave school. Right. So uh, it, it does happen over a long period of time and so there's many opportunities. I see that that long period of time I see that as opportunities so so the earlier we can intervene with those bullies we shouldn't wait till high school. That's right. We shouldn't I, wait till middle school. We should start all the way in elementary school. I got to interject this for both of you gentlemen. What we're talking about is, you know, we're talking about uh, starting real, real early, if I'm understanding correctly. All of these kind of ideals have been around, and these type of problems have escalated. I mean, how can we really get to it, it? Really, what I'm saying is a societal problem, so we got to change, basically, society. And so, we're we going to talk about that when we come back from our break. This is the Source Seeker Hour on Afro Vibes Radio, the number one internet station in the world. We'll see you when we come back. Welcome back, welcome back. We're having a very profound, super discussion on Afro Vibes Radio, the number one internet station in the world. And this, yes, is the Source Seeker Hour, and I'm the Source Seeker, uh, Baruti Carl Alexander. At this time, I want to just say, how you doing to uh, my friends who are listening on the radio, uh, the internet radio. Uh, Friends in Detroit, friends here in Houston, um, I, I thank you for all your support. And yes, I'm the source seeker, and I explain what the source seeker means, and I am one that has to find my expression. And we were talking about bullying. We were talking about bullying, a very profound discussion, and we were talking about security, and we were talking about guns. Guns, guns, we have a lot of guns here in the United States. What is one of the ways that we can become more civilized? Is it a, a point that we need to ban the AR-15s? Will that ever happen? Is that politically doable? Okay, we're going to talk to Mr. Uh, Rusty Adams. He, he's a former counselor, uh, education specialist, uh, very much knowledgeable on school discipline. Uh, Mr. Rusty, what you say about what I was talking about earlier? Well, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, guns and teachers being armed. Uh, I don't necessarily have a, a problem with that in the school if that's what you know a community decides to do. I think that is a community decision. Uh, but at the same time, I, I am kind of concerned that teachers have bad days and, and even policemen uh, don't know what's going to happen until they're in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they'll be able to, to truly use that gun and, and, and harm another individual. So, uh, you know, as a Texan, I own lots of guns. I think I've bought <laughs> two guns in my life, and I think family have given me about eight or ten guns. You know, so guns are out there, and I don't think we're going to change that. Uh, but I, I really don't uh, feel good about metal detectors. Uh, uh, I, I just think that it, it's starting to sound more like a, a, a prison, a jail, a uh, jail. A courthouse, and, and I don't think we necessarily. But can we really it. separate that aspect of society from the security necessary to live in this particular world? We've had all of these particular school shootings, and kids are on the street at this particular time. They are protesting. They saying, "Keep us safe." They saying, "Do something about this problem." So you know, it, it's not about talking anymore. It's about trying to get something done. Um, it, you had a comment, Brother Durst. Well, I, I think that um, two things. One is uh, we, we talked about uh, bullying has been going on again as time and morning. We use schools as, as an example. Uh, lunch money has been taken from bullies since in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and here in the 2000s. People have been made fun of how they look since 30s, 40s, 50s, and here in the 2000s. People have made fun about a person's economic situation from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and the 2000s. What makes now in the 40s and the 50s and 60s when people were making fun and taking lunch money, but now in the 2000s they now uh, get to the point where they want to retaliate back by shooting. Again, I contend as I go back to my initial thing that it was not uh, dealt with from the initial standpoint of standing up to that particular person and saying no more. Um, now. Uh, Brother Rusty and I have a, 
we may have a, a slight um, difference in how we could handle it. My thing is to handle it directly. My thing is to handle it uh, in the same manner that uh, it is. It, it comes to you uh, because it becomes hypocritical when we talk about well, go, let's talk it out, let's go and d find an adult. When a country, when we were attacked and the, those towers were knocked down, we didn't have no, we didn't have no discussion of who. There was no to be attacked in the manner in which we felt we were uh, aggressed. That's kind of my point that we got to be real about society and even in the school we may have to be real there and take a different because even though we might want just love to be in every classroom and there's everybody smiling in the hall, there are differences, there are differences of opinion in the minds of people where some people don't want that kind of environment. Some people are, are get violent in, in those kind of circumstances. I mean, there are all kinds of people in the world. So that's what I'm, I'm saying about that. Uh, I want you to finish your comment. Well, I'm not and I'm not necessarily saying have to get violent. If, if someone uh, trying to take take your lunch money, don't let them take it and, and, and uh, push back with them in a manner that they are trying to aggress you in. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. Because, again, it becomes hypocritical if, to the student and confusing to the student when they feel that their lunch money is getting taken, they're getting thrown on the ground, and then when they go to the to, to the adult, and the adult tells them X, Y, and Z, you no, know, we will talk about it, let's bring the bully in, and then when they get home on the news and they see that particular country is attacked, and the next thing they you know, we're, we're we're warming up the warships, we're we we we're, we're, we're dusting off the That's button, to, we're dusting off the button to the missiles. That's now, true. Now you just told me to talk it out. You just told me to see, mm -hmm. can, but then I get home and the, and the, the, and just by virtue of uh, the same type of someone trying to intimidate us, we go in a manner that is uh, completely different from what you just told me a few hours ago. So this, this is, this, this just So I, I, I go back to what I'm saying. It's really a societal problem because no what you're saying is, is there's a hypocritical uh, mindset out there and that kid really and sees confused. the real. Yeah. So uh, I do see what you're talking about. Yes, well, Russ. I don't want anyone to think that I'm sitting sitting here saying that we just need to all get together and love each other and sing kumbaya because that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying as adults we have a responsibility in those different institutions to intervene. And I no think doubt. there's a myth here that says that somehow educators, principals, whoever that they can somehow change behavior with just given consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the main consequences for the longest time was a paddling, you know, with a board. And uh, many, many, many school districts have done away with that. But there are still some school districts in Texas that allow corporal punishment. Why do you think they gave, that they, they, they put away with the corporal punishment? Because it didn't Lawsuits. change behavior. No, it didn't change behavior. Well, probably lawsuits, but the problem is, is it doesn't change behavior. And if we really want to change the behavior of a, of a child that's having a problem in school, then we need to do an intervention. It doesn't change behavior. some behavior because Miss Wagner whooped my butt and it changed my behavior. I learned how to write real good but right you there. You were a good kid, Carl. You but, were a good kid. But Russell, I wasn't always good. Go ahead. But, but Russell, I, I, I think that we, I think we, uh, the behavior that wasn't changed, I think those are outliers. In other words, I think 90% with that paddle, help, and, and we, we want to hang our hat on this, that 10%. But let's look at the ninety percent. But, but let's look at that ninety percent and say, okay, that ten percent is an outlier, and maybe they got more issues. Regardless, and, and correct the pattern, but we may have to do more things. But and, and if I it's ninety percent, and, and, and what I would say is, you're not going to save everybody. Yeah. Everybody is not going to be saved. Somebody is going to be uh, that that one that attempts to be a bully. Somebody is going to be the one that kind of goes off the deep end. I mean, that's just the way society yes. is. Everybody's not going to be perfect, so I would, I would yes say let's let's concentrate on the ninety percent and give ourselves some protections against the ten percent. You had something to say, uh, Mr. Dirk? No, I, I, I mean, it, like the, the last thing is again. I think we talked about this uh, this thing with the uh, the guns and the. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, and, and what is and what is the vetting and what is the vetting process? I mean, there's so many. Uh, Loop, uh, holes in this thing in terms of arming people. And what kind of gun is it going to be? Is it going to be a kind of gun that you take one shot, you're going to... Uh, uh, and and what about them? if a, a, a student takes a gun from you and goes from there? There are a lot of things. I do know, I just see it as a 
somewhat of a political ball rolling down the hill to a certain extent. And I'm concerned about that. You know, I have a 19-year-old son. I have a 14-year-old a daughter. I, sometimes they get up and with me. I know what they're going to do with somebody else. So, <sighs> I mean, yeah. Again, we're coming, and again, these are some very horrible things. Don't get me wrong. But it's a knee-jerk reaction. You want to arm people now. Uh, but we've had, I mean, these things, it's one too often. It's like, uh, how many plane crashes do we hear? I mean, you hear a plane crash, it makes the national because we don't have them that often. But we don't have a knee-jerk reaction and start talking about, okay, we need to do X, Y, Z. And that's what we're doing right now. And let's kind of go after the, you keep saying that the societal problem of, make, of, of the child thinking that they have, first of all, they have access to the gun, and then thinking that the solution is a uh, solution that is it's not temporary, it's final. When they get shot and that person is dead, this is not a video game. You cannot press reset and that person comes back. Very definitely. So society has to take a look at, again, what is taking place in these children. Children, you think about this, children's mind, they think they, they can go in there and harm somebody else and not think it's okay. Yes. Um, it is a societal problem. What are some of the societal things that maybe we can do. Next week we're going to have on our, our candidates, uh, 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 State Board of Education member Brother Lawrence Allen is going to be here and I'm going to ask him these questions and uh, we're going to try to get to it because it is a societal problem and the legislatures and the, the TEA, those are the ones that's going to make our educational changes in here in Texas. What are some of the things that we think we need to do? Well, I would just say and I'm, I'm going to give you an example from a school that I worked in because we had a big problem with behavior in our school. Uh, kids didn't feel safe, the parents didn't want their kids coming to that school, and so we decided we would do something about it. And our principal was the one that took the lead and decided he needed help because he was old school and he thought that he could swing the board and change behavior. But we were a small school of only about 225 students, and in a year we had a thousand office referrals. That's like five officers per, 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 student. per student. And you know that really wasn't that because there were a lot of kids that were good kids, so they weren't were getting office referrals, so there was a select group that were getting a lot of office referrals. It wasn't changing behavior, so we implemented a process called positive behavior support at our school, and it's something that's going around the nation. It's something that Houston Independent School District has begun to do, and so we, we started implementing... Can you tell me the name of that again? Yeah. Positive Behavior Support. And uh, the person that started that up was uh, PBS. Randy, Randy Sprick. Okay. And then there's another guy that does uh, positive behavior support interventions. His name is George Sagai. Okay. So both those guys have similar kinds of interventions. And, and it was actually funded through the special education department at the U.S. Department of Education. Okay. So it has, a, has had really good backing uh, to do. But we went from 1,000 office referrals. Uh, the first year we just looked at our system. So, you know, when you were saying that board helped you, well, that board helped you because you're a good kid. It helped you because you're a good kid. You, you know, I mean, not saying y'all weren't bad kids. Sometimes I got, I got spanked too uh, by the board. But there's other things we could do. We didn't have to have the board. But that, at that time, that's what they thought that we needed. That was the consequence. Yeah, you know, it's funny to me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We're educators, and our thing is to look at best practices and apply best practices. How come we don't go to these schools that they have these low? Uh, office referrals, that they, they have minimal violence, that have the children doing it. How come we don't go to these schools, see what the common threads and denominators are, and apply them across the board? This is not something that we got to guess at. This is not something we got to roll the dice at, because there are schools out there that they don't have these particular problems. There are schools out there that don't have metal detectors. Uh, there are schools out there that don't have, and looks like, an, an, uh, an armed uh, prison or, uh, or, or jailhouse that are educating the children, they have minimal, uh, uh, I guess, uh, things during the day that disrupt the educational process. Let's take those best practices, and I, and, I, and I contend that you will find that part of the thing is that you're going to have caring teachers, you're going to have engaged instruction in terms of the learning styles of, of the children taking, to, uh, taking the place. I, I guarantee that part of the thing is it's going to be very quick and immediate response to any type of situations in terms of, of working it out. And I also guarantee that it is going to be parent involvement. Um, so those are the things that, again, we work off of best practices, but we're not utilizing best practices when we see a particular situation. The only thing I'll say on that is we have a, a lot of different learning styles. 
we have a lot of different community concerns like this particular community might culturally be culturally be different than this other community. Take that into account, no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, take that, take that into account, no problem. Again, best practice will show you because they are going to find, you will find that there has to be uh, a situation perhaps that the, the students look one way and the instructors look another way. Maybe that is a problem. Maybe there is some lack of cultural sensitivity, if you will. But what if you kind of uh, put the situation where the student is now looking at someone that looks like them? Someone okay. that, that they can aspire to, 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 to be like. Okay. And then someone, that, and the instructor knowing... Role models. Role models. Okay. And then someone knowing that that was me sitting in that seat and I handled it a little bit differently. Okay, go ahead, Rusty. You have comments? As part of positive behavior support, I, I worked at uh, Education Service Center Region 6 in Huntsville and also the Education Service Center 13 in Austin. And as part of those programs, we had, we had cohorts of schools. And then as we brought new schools on, we did exactly what you're saying. We would bring those people to those schools and so that they could begin to see how, how the school and climate and environment was different. And you're right, we took them to schools that were similar to their school so that they could say, oh, this is us. And so, but it, but it takes time. Yes. It's not a quick fix. It's not like you just throw money at it. You've got to have buy-in from the community and the teachers and the students. And so, I, let me just finish. I want to tell you all, as far as the office referrals, because we went from a 1,000 office referrals before we started. After the first year, when all we did was look at our common areas of school and set common guidelines that we taught the students, how do you behave in the cafeteria? How do you behave in the hall? How do you behave after school, before school? That our office referrals went down to 400 office referrals. Mm. So we cut it that much just by looking at common areas, but you can't stop there. Then you have to take this whole message into the classroom and get some guidelines where the teachers develop their guidelines. So it's not like, you know, the principal saying you have to do this in your classroom because the teacher is the boss of their classroom. That's right. So the teacher has to develop their rules for their class. Uh, after we did that in the second year, we went down to 200 office mm. referrals for the whole year. The, the last part, and this is the part y'all are getting at, it's kind of like there's going to be those kids that need a lot of intervention. And those are the kids that you begin to focus on. So if we look at the first year, we're kind of dealing with the 80% getting everybody on board. The second year, we're dealing with that uh, probably another 15%. And then that third year, it boils down to about 5 to 10% of kids yeah. that need a lot of intervention and a lot of help. And those guys that were at Columbine or at Parkland High School, they could have benefited from that because they were probably that 5 to 10% that needed that extra help. So that third year, Carl, at the end of that year, we went down to 100 office referrals. Oh, uh, to, yeah, to 100 office referrals. So in three years, we went from 1,000 office referrals to 100 office referrals. During that time, the community bought into what we were doing because everyone was a part of it. At the end of that three years, we became a national blue ribbon school. Remember, three years ago, kids didn't want, parents didn't want their kids coming to our school. And I don't blame them. But we created an environment that supported them emotionally, but it also was good academics because we didn't just sing, sit around and sing Kumbaya. We were, we were talking about if we have an expectation of a student, we teach that expectation. We just don't expect it because your experience is home. I know a lot of times people say, well, they should know that. Well, if we haven't taught them, we can't expect them to know it. Once we've taught it, then we can't expect them to know it, and then we can decide, okay, what's the other intervention we need? Let me, let me say this. Both of y'all have very good ideas, suggestions. I kind of believe something is going to happen. Now, this is not necessarily what I want to happen, but this is where I think the ball, political ball, is rolling down a hill to. Uh, it's, it, a school is going to become much more community-based and computer-based. For instance, in a community of, of, of parents, you might have five homes. They get together, and they're going to hire one teacher. And that teacher is going to maybe come to a, 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 one of the houses or just do everything online. That, in my opinion, is... Now, there are going to be segments of students that will not be able to, excuse me, uh, go with that approach. But... Uh, that's where the public school system, and unless there's some radical changes within the public school system. Now, you're going to have a good school here. You're going to have a good school there. But wasn't, quote, unquote, Parkland a good school? It was a very good school. 
I mean, you, you see where I'm going with this. So those type of things can happen at a good school because we have not changed the, the, the systemic problem, which is the, the societal rot that is shifting and going toward our students, our young people, and that's what these students on the street are clamoring for. They are clamoring for some real change. I still say we are putting band-aids on those particular problems and until we as a society say that's very important. It's more important than whether this particular athlete makes 35 million or whether he makes 40 million, but until we get that mindset as a country, we're going to continue to have a, a ball rolling down the hill. Uh, you, you, uh, do you have any more comments I, on that, yeah, sir? I think, I think, again, going back to your point, Donald Lewis Farrakhan, he said it like this. He said, education, the way it's taught now, is not really healthy because education is giving you and training you to go out and get a job to make money. Okay. Education is to, praise, to bring out of you the gifts, the talents, the, the things that has been deposited in, in you uh, by the creators so that you can be able to express them and then if in expressing them you're happy and if you happen to make money with fine but it's not for the purpose of uh, just, just strictly make money and so uh, but if you do anything good money will find you that is true and, 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 and let me say this uh, no matter what color you are everybody got basically the same needs like as uh, Abraham Maslow says he says okay uh, we have a need to belong, we have a need for security, we have a need for love. We have all of those particular needs and again it comes back to a societal problem and it comes back to the issue of how are we going to correct our society, our culture. We do have a, a situation of a racial divide, we have a situation of Me Too divide or sexism. We have all of these particular things and it seems like we have them more than other countries because other countries do not have the same amount of school violence and different kinds of societal violence that we have. At least there are many countries that don't. At this time, we're going to take a break. Uh, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up at this time also. Everybody get ready for the Brain Source Game Show, the fun game of geography and science. Our next episode will be live June 16th at the historic Shape Community Center here in Houston. Go see the past game shows on www.sourceseeker.net and sign up to be a contestant today if you want to be on the Brain Source Game Show. I will be the host. Check it out, uh, the Brain Source Game Show on sourceseeker.net. I'm your host, Baruti Carl Alexander. Yes, I'm the Source Seeker. Thank you for joining me here on the Source Seeker Hour. Please thank my guests. Uh, I would like to give them an opportunity to uh, give you any feedback and information. If, uh, if somebody wishes to argue with you, Rusty, or dispute <laughs> your words, or say, I don't agree with you, how can they uh, contact you? Um, can they contact me through your show? Certainly, you can contact me. You can contact me directly uh, on Facebook, Baruti Amakiche, Baruti Carl Alexander. You you all know that, uh, brother Durst. How can they contact you? Uh, Durst D U R C E four five at gmail dot com. Durst D U R C E four five at gmail dot com. And thank you, uh, uh, brother Baruti Carl, uh, for this opportunity to just kind of share. And we look forward to being able to come back and share some more. Oh, that sounds good. Everybody, thank you for joining us here on the Soul Seeker Hour, number one show on. Uh, Afro Vibes Radio Worldwide. We're going to see you next time when we're going to have our Meet the Candidates uh, episode. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.